Welcome, dear viewers, to Couch Warrior TV on YouTube. I am the Couch Warrior, and this is Unbound Season 2 Let's Play. This video series is the companion to the Character Crusade Unbound podcast. And in each episode, we explore Skyrim roleplay concepts and ideas through actual gameplay. Season 2 of the podcast is called The Ghosts of Yore. And our character concept is Breezy Baudelaire. She is a student of the Order of the Divine Scribe. And we're going to learn some things about the Order of the D Divine Scribe. In fact, we're going to be making up a whole bunch of crap about the Order of the Divine Scribe because there is very, very little out there about them, which is great. I love a situation like that. So that works out perfect. That gives us a lot of room to kind of play around and invent things on our own. Uh, so I have kind of a boilerplate explanation I go through here for people who are noobs to the series and want to get involved. This is uh, community participation, and what I'm doing uh, with my Let's Play is kind of an example to uh, sort of practice what I preach and give you something that you can watch that'll give you some ideas about how to put into play some of the crazy stuff that I talk about in the podcast. And I, I think this is critical on this one because there's already been a fair amount of confusion about what the actual homework is for Unbound 2. So we'll be touching on some aspects of that. I won't go into it in great detail because I already have something posted out there that I think explains it pretty well that you can find uh, in the podcast stream. Uh, you can also find it linked from our Discord community, okay? All right, so for those of you who are new to the series, Character Crusade Unbound Skyrim Roleplay Workshop is a bi-weekly podcast focused on community roleplay. Our objective is to think outside the box and create the best possible play experiences through challenges, discussions, mods, and community interaction. Every season, we issue a challenge, the community creates characters, and then we all play together. Each podcast, we recap the challenges, discuss the things we have learned, and answer listener questions. To keep the conversation relevant and inspiring, we assign role play homework and sometimes, depending on the challenge, we do level caps. Now, in Season 1, we did level caps. In Season 2, we are not doing level caps, so no worries, all right? If you're concerned about level caps, do not sweat it. There are no level caps. Play as much as you want to play, because this season of Unbound is all about narrative. It has nothing to do with game mechanics. The narrative we're going to present you with, you are going to incorporate into your story... <clears throat> Uh, and that can happen regardless of what type of character you're playing at what level, all right? So the idea is <clears throat> we all kind of work together in the community through the podcast, answering questions, helping each other out to try and stay on track, and then we all share our amazing stories at the end of the season. Uh, if you uh, didn't know, uh, this last Monday, we just had our finale for season one. Joe is working like a madman trying to get that produced. Uh, we were hoping to get it out today, but it's going to come out over the weekend. Um, that, in large part, has to do with a significant change in our recording process, where we're recording all of our voices on separate tracks now instead of one track. So he's got literally twice as many tracks to deal with as he did before, and so he's working on that. And so far, the recording sounds really great. He's just got lots of material to get through. So... I, we are fully expecting that that will be published this weekend. So for those of you who missed the finale, you'll be able to hear that later on this weekend in the podcast stream. And once I have the recording in hand, I'll probably make a video of it, as we always do, and put it up on Couch Warrior TV. So if you'd rather take it in via uh, YouTube, you can do that, or you can check it out in the podcast stream. All right. So that gets us into the meat of it. So, this, as I said, this season is all about narrative. Hang on a second. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. I'm de dealing with, like, uh, perpetual chronic congestion. Always the congestion. I don't know what it is. Um, so, our character for this season is Breezy Baudelaire. Baudelaire. She is starting... At level one, as I said, she is Breton. All right, and we've got a little bit of a background story here for her. She uh, comes from a family of middle upper class means, and Breezy is the uh, only girl in uh, a family of five children. And as a result of that, 
There have been many attempts over the years by her brothers and her parents to try to protect her, to try to coddle her, but she has resisted that uh, constantly. And she, a as a result of that, she has become an individual who is sort of known in her community for being rebellious just for the sake of being rebellious. Uh, she is constantly railing against authority because uh, she feels, she has this deep-seated feeling that if she allows herself to be stalled if if she starts if she stops moving forward someone's going to tie her down and she's not going to fulfill her destiny so we've kind of got this this character who um, is in her late teens early 20s she is kind of going on to school she's had several suitors who have have come into her life people that she just was not interested in and she's driven them all away either through just bluntness or through uh, somewhat savage pranks. Uh, she is kind of a prankster, that kind of thing, doing things to make these, these young men look bad, um, and as a result, getting out of these fixes she finds herself in. At some point, the parents finally decide, okay, we, we just can't control Breezy. We just need to let her do whatever it is she's going to do. And so they agree to send her off to a school, to the school of her choice. And the school of her choice is a place called the Order of the Divine Scribe. And it is equivalent to, say, imagine, uh, imagine sort of a religious college, a, a four-year college that is started by monks but offers kind of, you know, your your eventually transforms into something that offers kind of a standard liberal arts type of education, right? Um, we have a lot of colleges like that here in Minnesota that, that at their roots are religious institutions but have transformed into just private colleges, learning institutions where people don't have to be of a particular do denomination in order to attend them. And so the Order of the Divine Scribe, there are, there's very little known about it, and it does appear in lore, and you can find it on UESP. Uh, the monks who are part of that order initially, or the people who are part of that order, worship Xarxes. And if you're not familiar with Xarxes, Xarxes is the Divine Scribe. He was considered to be sort of uh, the right-hand person and scribe for Oriel. So it is technically a god that is kind of part, has been in the past anyway, part of the elven pantheon. But one of the things that we do know about the Bretons is that the, the elven pantheon has been incorporated into the Bretons pantheon in many ways. There, ha there are some subtle differences, but uh, the order of the divine scribe is, is really all based on this, this um, kind of um, worship of Xarxes and all of the trappings that go with that. She goes off to this school, and the reason that she chose this school is she expected that something like the Order of the Divine Scribe, she was going to have access to a lot of information. And what she is looking for, what she is looking for, is she's looking for information that will tell her more about how she can use her innate gifts. She has some gifts already that have to do with elemental magic, particularly anything having to do with kind of storm magic, specifically wind magic and, and lightning kind of storm-related magic. And we're going to be talking about this in a lot of detail throughout this Let's Play as we're selecting spells that are going to go into Breezy's toolbox. We'll be looking for things across all of the different schools of magic that actually fit. So in essence, what we're going to be doing with Breezy is we're going to be making our own, kind of our, our I guess our own domain of magic. And it is going to include spells probably across most of, of the spell trees. So, uh, But we're going to be very much cherry-picking the things that, that we think we can use and that we think we can kind of build some story around to say that, yes, this could be a storm-based power, kind of makes sense. And I, I think of her her powers being more really focused on wind. So I don't want to get too much into the cold magic, even though you could make a case for certain spells having blizzard effects and stuff like that. And we may look at some of that stuff as we go into higher levels. But to start with, she's going to be very focused on wind magic, and then there's going to be kind of a smattering of things in there that have to do with, with uh, shock and lightning. 
Now, in addition to that, we've got some spells that we'll be paying attention to in Restoration, for sure, and then also in Alteration. So, and I've already got some ideas about how we might use those. And then we'll also be making use, eventually, uh, of Okado's Recital, and we'll be basically setting up some of these spells to feel more like uh, environmentally triggered spells or innate powers, if you will. Um, so that's what we know. All right, so you can see here um, up on the screen, I've got a couple of different tools for you. One is on story structure, and this has to do with the homework. Uh, before we get into that, I would like to touch on the circles of character conflict first, because I've kind of mapped some things out for Breezy having to do with the circles of character conflict that are going to play into how we role play this character throughout. All right. If you're not familiar with the circles, we have, as you can see there, three concentric circles. Uh, the center circle has to do with personal conflict. The middle circle is interpersonal conflict. And uh, the outer circle is societal conflict. All right. So let's talk about some of the characteristics of Breezy as a person. Um, the, the trick here, I think, is always to have a good idea what's going on in the center circle. Okay, so we're going to talk about the center circle. And then, like a pebble in a pond, we start from the center circle, and the character's influence spreads outward, and we get some of the logical effects of a character's personality at each of the other rings. So we'll kind of discuss it from the center outward. All right? So... If we look at that story structure diagram, you can see at the very top we have a segment that runs all the way across uh, the story called the narrative arc. And this is kind of, this is the character's journey from end to end. And this is something that I like to think about. It's not a hard and fast rule. It's not something I set out to follow, uh, absolutely. Um, if something happens in game that steers us away from it, that's cool. But I like to start with some idea of what the narrative arc is. And this makes sense because from the very start, you kind of need to know um, at the character's core who they are. And what this journey really is, the narrative arc, is what are they going from to? We talk about this kind of concept of value pairs. So what are they going from and what are they ending up with, right? I think of Breezy's character journey as being going from a closed off person to being an open person. <clears throat> And by closed off, what I mean is she's closed herself off in many ways emotionally from other people. She has a fear of becoming emotionally attached. Her greatest fear is that if she becomes emotionally attached to a man, she might be tempted to marry that person. Now suddenly she's married, suddenly she's having kids, and suddenly she's not fulfilling her destiny. So she keeps everyone at arm's length because she's worried about being tied down, and that closes her off. Um, in addition to that, I think she's journeying from being defensive to being accepting. She has this deep-seated sense that other people believe, because of the family she comes from, because of her gender, that she is somehow not capable. And so she's constantly pushing back against that and striving to be the best at what she does, the best in class, the strongest. She's trying to, she's trying to one-up everybody all the time. And that comes from this sense of defensiveness that she has. So part of her journey is going to be trying to lose, trying to gain enough confidence in her own ability and her place in the world that she can lose that sense of def defensiveness and be a more accepting and open person. And then the last part of that is her, her journey from to go from being misunderstood to being truly understood by those people who know her and love her. And these things directly relate to these circles that I'm talking about. So at the core, we're saying that her personal conflict is this deep-seated fear she has of commitment. Okay, And that comes from the fact that her parents were overprotective um, and she feels she needs to prove her capability. Right, So she's got this fear of commitment and this um, sort of self-doubt about whether or not she's capable, so she overcompensates. And because of that, she's a strong personality. She's um, the kind of person who, you know, comes from a family of, of mostly boys, and so to keep up, she had to play rough like the boys were playing, and she learned to do that, and she's very good at it. So that is off-putting sometimes to other people. So 
she has this constant inner conflict about being tied down, about being good enough, about proving to the world that she's capable. So what does that tell us about that middle ring? Well, if you've got a person who's acting like that, that means they're always this contrarian, right? They're always pushing back. She's, um, <clears throat> she's always contrary. She's always stubborn. She can sometimes be mean and cruel, especially in her pranks. She comes off as irresponsible, comes off as being rash sometimes because of this, right? Because she's making decisions about what she thinks is in her own best interest without consulting anyone and without letting anyone in. So more often than not, the decisions that she's making about her own life make sense in her head, but come as a complete surprise to everyone around her because they just don't understand her. So that, that is really a key. So there are people in that inner circle, her friends and family, who probably feel snubbed by her. They feel... Uh, cheated by her, they feel uh, put out by her, they feel abandoned by her. And we saw that a little bit um, as you guys were sitting in the lobby. I tried to put some letters and little notes into uh, the screens here that kind of give you a sense of that. There is a note there from her fiancé who she met at school who is wondering where she is. The minute he proposed to her, suddenly she disappeared, right? There's a letter there from her father saying, why the hell are you in Skyrim? right? Uh, you understand that you took all the money I gave you for tuition and you spent it on travel expenses, which is essentially a one-way ticket to Skyrim. What the hell are you doing? I hope you've got a plan, all right? And we're going to see more of that during the break. I've got a special slide I'll put up when we go to intermission that also has an additional note on it from a friend of hers. So we got a note from family, we've got a note from a, a love interest, and we've got a note from a close friend, all of which indicate that they are either misunderstanding Breezy or are upset with Breezy for some reason. And this makes sense when you consider who she is at her core. So let's go out to the larger circle. And the larger circle is where, is where we get a really interesting situation with Breezy, and that is that from a societal perspective, uh, she's kind of the polar opposite of who she is in her personal, interpersonal relationships. She's friendly. She's open to strangers, right? She's, she's talkative. She's law-abiding. She comes off as self-assured and capable. It's only to people who know her and love her and known, have known her all her life who treat her differently than a stranger would that she pushes back. You know that saying, right? You always hurt the ones you love. Well, it's the ones that you love who know you the best, and sometimes um, having people know you that deeply can feel like a threat. And so Breezy comes off as, as very capable and friendly to those people who don't know her at all. But to those people who are in her inner circle and know her more deeply, she can be very difficult to deal with. So <clears throat> that is the character that we've got kind of going psychologically, all right? So that brings us to the point, where does the story start? Well, here's the deal. She goes off to school. Uh, she goes off to school, uh, the Order of the Divine Scribe. She spends maybe a year there. While she's there, she becomes uh, friends with a young man named Narander, and they pal around, they have lots of fun, they learn stuff together, they study together, and pretty soon it turns into something more than just a friendship. Uh, and that seems fine with Breezy, but then there comes a point where he actually scrapes together the money to buy a ring. He presents that to her. She comes off as excited, but immediately the following day, she enrolls in an exchange program with the Mage College in Winterhold, and she leaves without telling anyone, including her quote-unquote boyfriend or fiancé-to-be. Um, and she just vanishes because... Left alone in her room at night, she starts thinking about all the things that could go wrong, starts thinking about the idea of being tied down and not fulfilling this quote-unquote destiny she thinks she has. And suddenly she packs it all in, and she takes all the money that was reserved for her tuition for the following year, and she spends it on travel expenses to get to Skyrim. So we have a situation where she makes it into the program, she manages to make it, to the Mage College in Skyrim, but she has no money whatsoever if she would want to return. And she does this without telling anyone she's going to do it. So her friends don't know she's leaving. Narander doesn't know she's leaving. Her parents certainly don't know that she's leaving. 
So one of the letters that we saw there was a, a letter from her father just saying, hey, you understand, right? You used all of your tuition on travel expenses. That's basically a one-way ticket to Skyrim. Uh, I hope you have a plan, sweetheart. See you later, right? So there you have it. So that's where we kind of start. So where I'm going to be starting this adventure is I'm going to be starting at the College of Winterhold. She has basically already been enrolled. She already has a room, but she has not attended any classes. And that's where we're going to be starting. So as you can guess, the Mage College quest line is going to be a pretty significant one here. But we're going to be folding some other things in. And there are some special circumstances. The fact that she's not a full-fledged student of the Mage College, she's essentially the, the equivalent of an exchange student. Um, there could be some sort of uh, social and bureaucratic problems that she might have in the college because she's not formally an accepted Mage College student. That sets her apart from the rest of the students. All right. So that is our, that is our starting point. Let's talk a little bit about what we're going to focus on for this character. Um, because we're talking about elemental magic, my I am going to be using uh, Apocalypse Spell Package. I am going to be using uh, Elemental Destruction Magic. Uh, I have the patch for those, as was mentioned earlier in the comments. Okay, uh, I am also going to be uh, using the full Ordinator set of perks and a lot of stuff there. Uh, we're probably going to be starting at, say, Adept Difficulty, and we'll kind of see how it goes. All right. I don't know quite yet how deadly some of these spells are. And Breezy is a little bit unusual in that she is not going to be focused as heavily as other mages on the idea of wearing robes. She will be a light armor wearing character. So there, there are going to be some differences there. She will use uh, tools as well, like uh, staves and scrolls. I have introduced some additional mods into the game that will allow me to do things like uh, she'll be able to write her own scrolls. She'll be able to take spells that she finds in scrolls and write them into spell books and then learn them as spells. Um, so there are a number of different things. I think I've got right now 122 mods in the lineup, and we will be expanding that as we go. Uh, there are a few things I've got my eye on that I know we're going to use, but we'll incorporate those when we need them. Um, so we're going to be looking at definitely alteration and destruction primarily. There's going to be a fair amount of use of restoration, and then there will be occasional use of conjuration, possibly. Um, I don't see a lot of use for Breezy when it comes to illusion magic. Not yet. But if something presents itself in game, if she's intrigued by it, who knows? We may we may do something there. But her investments in in terms of perks are going to be primarily in destruction, alteration, enchanting, and light armor. Now she's not going to be a weapon wielding character. She is going to be using magic as her primary weapon. But um, one of the things that I thought was interesting and that I'm toying around with here is the idea that Breezy is able to use her innate powers around wind, ma wind magic to basically move faster than the other people around her, almost as though she perpetually has the wind at her back. And this has worked out really interesting because there's a couple of different things. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, I, I got my hands on right away was uh, a ring that allows that basically speeds up her movement rate. But in addition to that, also a restoration spell called Mystic Wind, which will recharge her magicka when she's sprinting. It'll recharge her magicka much faster, which is kind of a cool thing. So, and there's a couple other things going on. We've got Andromeda, Andromeda um, Standing Stones in play here, and I believe that I'm using the powers associated with the Apprentice Stone, which means that her novice level spells, she does not lose any magicka whatsoever. She can basically use novice level spells indefinitely. However, uh, that that mod will randomly determine whether or not those spells do do 50% uh, more damage or 50% less. So while she will not be strapped for magicka when she's using novice level spells, there's a chance that they may be doing a lot less damage than what she would normally be able to do if she wasn't using that stone. So 
that'll be kind of interesting. It adds an element of, of kind of wildness and unpredictability to the way her magic works, which I think is a great reflection of her early stages of learning. So um, that's kind of the direction that we're going. So primarily she's going to be focused on this wind-related magic. And the thing that I like about going, going the light armor route is the light armor route has many, many perks in that tree that will... Um, benefit us when it comes to movement, right? So we get bonuses when we're moving in combat, and we when we combine that with her wind-related magic and some of these other things that she'll be using that play off this idea of movement, what we're going to have, I think, is a character who's going to be uh, very quick and very mobile and so forth, uh, but maybe very vulnerable in certain situations where she gets overwhelmed or when she's in closed spaces. And that brings me to another point. So what are some of our game rules? Uh, when I talk about game rules, I'm thinking about are there things in the game that we're going to capitalize on that help us understand the character a bit more? What are those play rules like? I don't have many right now, and we're going to be forming some, I think, as we go and as she, as she gets exposure to things. As far as just the character in general, it made sense to me that she would be apprehensive about enclosed spaces. For someone who is all about harnessing the wind and using it to her advantage and is all about movement, I think being in enclosed spaces could be a bit difficult for her. I'm not saying that it rises to the level of a phobia, but I think it will be... It, she would much rather be camping outside than staying in a small place. All right? Um, she is a bit of a tomboy and kind of a crude person in some ways. She doesn't... She doesn't bother herself a lot of times with niceties, with etiquette. Now, in certain situations, she will, but most of the time, she doesn't worry about that. So she likes drinking cheap wine, and she likes red meat, and she likes, you know, big heavy meals and stuff like that. She likes to sit quietly and study her books. Um, to her, the perfect idea of, uh, the idea of a perfect evening would be a cheap glass of wine, uh, probably an undercooked steak, and a stack of books, that kind of thing. The other thing that she's very interested in is just nature in and of itself. And um, in particular, the things she loves about nature is the wide open spaces, butterflies and birds and things that use the air and the breezes to travel. Things like that would be of particular interest to her. And we're going to see kind of how those things uh, present themselves as we go through. And we're going to um, latch on to those when it makes sense, I think. Remember, this is... Uh, this is a person who has lived most of their life pretty sheltered and has spent, spent their life trying to break out of that. And now she has managed to escape all of that. Um, even when she was at the Order of the Divine Scribe, people still knew where she was and what she was doing. Now she has truly broken away from everyone. And there's a certain amount of risk there, right? In that um, no one can help her. She's totally on her own. But the advantage is that she's totally on her own, right? Which is kind of where she wants to be. Now she needs to prove to herself that she can make it. All right? So uh, I think this is going to be kind of interesting. We're just going to... I wanted to make sure that I, I left enough of this kind of stuff open that we can have experiences as we go. Like I said... She's truly on her own now, and, and what that means, though, is because of that kind of sheltered, controlled background that she's had, she hasn't been exposed to a lot of stuff. So a lot of the spells we're going to encounter, um, the locations, obviously, the weather, um, the animals, monsters, all of these creatures, she's probably never seen them before, or if she has, it's been more the pedestrian kind of stuff. She knows what a rabbit is, and she's seen plenty of rabbits, and she's seen plenty of foxes and deer, but, you know, who knows if she's had encounters with trolls? My guess is not, and I think the same goes for a lot of the other, you know, uh, these other creatures in Skyrim. So, I think that sets us up for... A really fun time and I think that is exactly where we want to be with the character we understand intimately what's going on inside her and then we kind of interact with our environment um, based on that knowledge 
Um, and then we kind of leave things open-ended so we kind of get to have a fun experience as we go, just taking things in and figuring out what we're going to internalize and incorporate into our character and what we're going to let go. So that is the plan. Everybody cool with that? 